Oh, this is fantastic stuff. I love all the stuff we're doing. And, and camp is just full of great stuff. There's great activities, there's great friendships, there's great community. And of course, we want to preserve that. Lots of photos to be taken to remember all the good times. Lots of tweets and Facebook statuses to share the good times with the world because deep down, I think every single one of us just wants to feel good. We want to enjoy this world. We want to do the good stuff. We want to know that we're going okay as a person. And you know, most of us start off life feeling pretty good. And when you're in primary school, you sort of bounce through as that happy little kid and no matter what goes wrong, you've got a big smile on your face and, you know, everything's cool and you love life and you love who you are. And then you get to high school and the dreaded enemy puberty enters the scene. Now, it's full of excitement. It's full of possibilities, it's full of new adventures, but somewhere as puberty strikes, often you don't quite feel as good about yourself as you did when you were a little kid. It's so easy to compare yourself with everybody else, and for the first time in your life, you've got to deal with the feeling that you feel yuck about yourself. Man, and that is hard to do because you look at other people around you who seem to be you know, so good looking and so suave and so cool and it's really easy to look at them and you just feel ugly. Or you look at people who are smart, they're clever, they know what to say, they've got the one-liners, they can get away with anything and it's really easy to look at those people and you just feel stupid. They are not feelings that are very easy to live with. Feeling yuck about yourself, feeling dumb sometimes, feeling ugly sometimes, and there is no limit of people who keep reminding you of your failings. Reminding you when you get it wrong. Even helpful people in your life, like parents and teachers and sporting coaches and youth leaders, well, every now and again, just remind you of where you stuffed up. But of course, the worst people for reminding you of your failings are your own friends who will make fun of you, who will make jokes about you, who will point out your mistakes, and sometimes you wander around not feeling that good whatsoever. And even the things that are fun sometimes don't feel as much fun as they used to be. Like if you've been on this camp for a number of years, hey, it's still fantastic, it's still brilliant, but there's a part of you that says, it's not quite as much fun as the first time I came. If you've been a Christian for a number of years, you're still dedicated, you're still faithful, but there might be something about you that thinks, being a Christian is not as much as a buzz as when I first became a Christian. Because, you see, being a teenager is actually hard work. All sorts of weird feelings are racing around inside of you, and sometimes it's hard to work out what they are, and even harder to work out what do you do about it. And we like to put the big, you know, I'm H-A-P-P-Y, smile on the outside. Your friends say, how are you going? You say, fantastic, I'm loving it, it's, it's great. But it might be that deep on the inside, where nobody can see, you mightn't be feeling that great at all. There might be a difficult feeling deep inside that you don't want anybody to ever find out about. Because you wouldn't want to admit that you're failing. You wouldn't want to admit that you're not on top of things. You wouldn't want to admit that you need somebody's help. And I know because I listen to you, I sit down, I chat with you, many of you carry that around and it all makes perfect sense. Because every human being needs to know that they're loved. Every human being needs to know that they're going okay. It's almost like every single one of us is born with a big neon sign around our neck saying, please love me. Tell me that I'm doing okay. 
I need to know that I'm cared for. That's the sort of situation that we all find ourselves in. Because they tell me that here are the two greatest needs of every human being. It's called significance and security. Now, let me explain to you what these needs are. Significance simply means I matter. There's a reason why I'm here. There's something I'm good at. There's something that means I'm not just a waste of space. And all of us need to feel that we're important, that somehow it matters that we're around on this planet, that we can achieve something and that we feel okay about who we are. And all sorts of things will give away that we need to feel significant. You know what? One thing that can happen that will make you feel incredibly significant is when you find a Coke bottle with your name on it. And suddenly you think, oh my goodness, the Coca-Cola company thinks I'm significant enough to put my name on. And you feel good about it and you take a photo of it. I matter. Or when great things happen in your life, you want to tell people about it. And that's natural and that's good. And if you've just done something fantastic, then you'll post it on Facebook and let people know you've just achieved a significant milestone in your life. If there's a manoeuvre on your, on your longboard that you've never quite perfected, you might put up a Facebook status like this. Finally can slide on my longboard. Lots of smiles. And that's brilliant. One of you guys put that up there. I'm thinking that's, that's brilliant. You need to know you're significant. Or maybe you've ordered some special shoes in the mail and they finally arrive. You need to let everybody know. My red vans arrived in the mail. And you want to celebrate all those big things in your life, and that's brilliant, and that's okay. That's our need to be significant. But the second need that we all have is a need to be secure. I'll tell you what that means. That I matter to somebody. That there is at least one person in the world who cares for me. There is at least one person in the world who loves me. If you can honestly think about your parents and with all their strengths and all their weaknesses and all the stuff they get right and all the stuff they get wrong and all the brilliant decisions they make and all the dumb decisions, if you can look at your parents and actually think, yes, I know they love me, a whole lot of your needs to be secure have been met by your parents. And that's brilliant. Some of those needs to be loved will be met by your friends. They have good mates around you, people that would live and die for you. Some of those feelings will be met by having a special friend that you hold hands with and quietly snuggle into when no one is watching that much. And ultimately, when you get married, your husband or your wife hopefully will be one of those people that lets you know you are absolutely loved. And seriously, we need to know that other people care for us. We need to know that other people are paying attention to us. There's been an interesting development in Facebook updates. A number of you will do something like this. You'll simply put up an update which says something like, TBH, that's it. To be honest, would you like an honest comment from me about you? But here's what, why do people do that? Because you'll see in the next line, I've blacked all the names out, 148 others plus those three names. 151 people in the first hour liked that comment. Now when you can get 151 people to say, we care about you deeply, we like your comment, does it make sense that's helping us to feel that other people care about us, that other people mean something to us, and that we mean something to them? You know, it gets even a little bit more serious sometimes, because some of you put updates like this, where you say, RIP, and you put your own name, like this 
if you would care. I've seen a number of you say something like that. Now, I realise it might be said half-jokingly. I realise there might be a little bit of a smile on your face. But do you understand that there is a desperate cry to think, if I died, would there be anybody who actually cared? Do I mean enough to other people on this planet that if I suddenly wasn't here anymore, that they would miss me? And that's the cry that all of us have. We need to know that we matter and we need to know that we matter to someone. Now, just for fun, the balance between these two things, to be significant, I matter, and to be secure, I matter to someone, the balance between those in the two genders is a little different. Now, both guys and girls both need both. But it's interesting, as you observe the male species, they have a greater need to be significant. They need to know that they matter. They need to know that they're important, that they've achieved something worthwhile. And all sorts of things will make guys feel good about themselves. And it's often what they'll achieve. It'll be the size of their muscles. It'll be the size of their car. It'll be the stuff that they own and the really cool tricks they can do. And you've got to understand, us guys need to know that we're significant. That very fragile male ego that you hear about, that's it. And so if it comes a choice for a guy to either feel significant or to feel loved, sometimes they'll go with the significant one. This always becomes fun when a guy gets a girlfriend and he also gets a car. Who's going to get his attention? There's the girlfriend. Well, of course, I love you, dear, and you're the only one in the world for me, and you mean more to me than anything else. Oh, my goodness, my car. <laughs> it's just sitting in the garage. Maybe I should polish it a little bit more. Maybe I should black the tyres and put a red rim around them to make them go faster. Let's see what I can do here. Let's go and buy all the accessories I could ever imagine and put them in my car because my car makes me feel so good. Oh, girlfriend, would you like to come with me? We could go for a drive to Repco. <laughs> might find a few things. I might even buy something for you there. Do you, you, see, you, you, you see, guys need both, but man, we've got such a huge need to feel significant. Trophies mean something to us and we love to display them and show off how good we are. Girls, of course, also need to know they're significant, but they really need to know that they're secure, that they are loved, that they are cared for. And often they will find that in their relationships with their friends and often it'll be found in the relationship with a best friend. Now, fellas, you've got to understand, girls have friendships on a level that we can't even imagine. Seriously, I look, see, I look at the girls here, I look at the great friendships you have and the care you show, and there's the blokes, you know, hitting each other and farting at each other and... <laughs> I'm thinking, man, you girls enjoy brilliant friendships like that. Guys, li listen in. Give you some secrets here. Girls will form friendships and have a turn into a social activity, something which you just think is an ordinary everyday function. Like if a girl wants to go to the toilet. <laughs> She's... Guys, you're just thinking functionary now. Whack it in, whack it out. Hang on, other way around. Whack it out, whack it in. <laughs> Gets messy when you mix that one up, I tell you. <laughs> Come on, guys, you're thinking minimal possible time, in, out, maybe wash your hands if you're really feeling hygienic that day. But you're thinking like 12 seconds, the whole thing's over. Girl wants to go to the toilet. It's almost like, hey, Hey, I think I might go and visit the ladies. You girls want to come with me? Oh, yes, let's all go together. <laughs> okay. 
Guys, do not try this. <laughs> Seriously, guys, do not try. Like, I'm thinking, look, I just need uh, to go to the toilet. Uh, Neil, um, would you like to come with me? Uh, it just doesn't work. Both guys and girls need to know both things, that they're significant and they're secure. We all need to know that we matter and that we matter to someone, but there seems to be a slight uh, bias in each of our two agendas as to what we really need. And if you don't understand there's a difference, it can end in disaster. Like if you end up marrying somebody and you haven't worked out, you have slightly different needs from each other, here's what can end up happening. The guy wants to be significant and often they'll find it in their work or their achievements. And they go off out there to their work and their achievements to feel really significant. And the wife is saying, I want my security in my relationship with my husband but he's off at work or off at his sporting team or off at his car club and I just want him and I want him around and I want to be cared for by him. And if you don't get the difference, it can lead to some bad situations. Sometimes there'll be a girl and she's got a boyfriend who treats her badly, you know, takes her for granted, is abusive of her, makes fun of her, and all her friends say to her, you've got to dump this guy, he's no good. And she sort of agrees with them, but she sort of keeps going out with them. Because for her, the pain of not having someone in that relationship with her is greater than the pain of someone who treats her in an abusive way. And I've just seen that one too many times where the girl stays with a guy who doesn't value her and treats her like trash and yet she will not leave the relationship because she hasn't worked out how her own needs are going to be met. And we will all do stuff like that because every one of us wants to feel good. Now can I teach you the three most popular ways of feeling good and these are the three dumbest ways to actually feel God. And yet we of the middle classes have become specialists in going to three particular uh, remedies to make us feel good. Here they are, take notes carefully. Number one, shop till you drop. Come on, it's called retail therapy. You're feeling down, you go to the shops, you've got some money, you've got a credit card, you've got a, a, a debit card, and you go and buy something and you feel good about it. And you take it home and you show it off to everybody, you go and get your hair done, you go and get your nails done, you go and buy some serious piece of hardware, you go and buy the latest techno gadget, and just for a short time, you feel good. But you know it doesn't last. The next day, that feeling's gone away. The thing you've bought has got scratched, it's old, it's out of date. Someone else has got something better. Shop to your drop is a dumb way of actually trying to feel good. Dumb way number two. Indulge till you bulge. Like, just have as much of everything as you possibly can. You've got to have every experience. You've got to go to every concert that's on. You've got to come to every camp that is run. You've got to get there. You've got to have every experience over and over and over again. And if you're not having an experience, you're bored and you're waiting for the next big thing that's going to happen. And you just indulge yourself. Or maybe you just keep eating. Because eating food makes you feel good. And you're not eating because you're hungry for food, you're eating because you're hungry to feel good. And you can see the bad effect it's having on you, but you just keep eating away. Indulge to you bulge is a dumb way of actually trying to feel good. You might get into a sexual relationship that you're not ready for, because you just want to feel good and you want to indulge yourself in a moment of brilliance even though you know it's tearing you down 
It's wasting you away and it's making you feel empty and dirty. Indulge till you bulge is not a good way of feeling good. Dumb way, dumb way number three. Run till you're done. Look to escape somewhere. Just run away. I want to escape to the movies. That could be your escape. Some people find their escape at the bottom of a bottle. Some people find their escape at the end of a funny cigarette. People will look for all sorts of ways just to escape the feeling that life's pretty ordinary. And you know that so many of the things that they do destroy them. We've got kids, high schoolers, beautiful people who will cut themselves because they want to escape the emotional pain they're feeling. And you can look at that and say, that's going to lead you nowhere. In fact, you're going to end up in a worse situation. But sometimes on the spur of the moment, we end up doing dumb things because all of us want to feel good even if it's looking at a website that we're not meant to be looking at, just for a moment we want to feel satisfied. And sometimes we'll chase down anything that helps us to feel that way. But there's the problem. None of them actually satisfy. None of them last. In fact, most of them destroy you and make you feel worse. When Isaiah writes to the people seven, eight hundred years before Christ, he is writing to a whole lot of people who do not feel good at all. As we learnt yesterday, they've been taken from their own country, their city is being devastated, it feels like God has abandoned them and they're not feeling good and they're chasing after all sorts of stuff to try and make them feel good. And as we look at Isaiah today, we're going to see that God has a message to people who want to feel good. And I want you to know this morning from the Bible that you are significant because God created you. And that you are secure because God loves you. Let's have a look together at Isaiah chapter 55. So, you got your Bibles there. Wa wave your Bibles around. Oh, there we are. Bibles everywhere. Thank you. You got your books. You got your pens. Let's look at Isaiah 55. And I want to show you what it is that God offers to you. Let's have a look at it together. Firstly, what God offers is free. Chapter 55. Verse 1. This is what God says. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. What God offers is free. And when God looks at you, no matter what is going on for you right now, no matter how you're feeling, whether you're feeling on top of the world or at the bottom of the world, God looks at you now and says, come, I want you here because I've got something brilliant to give to you. And you can see there in verse 1, he's saying, I want to give you everything that will satisfy you and I want to give it to you without cost. I want to give it to you for free. Now, I don't know about you, I'm kind of a cynical guy. When I see that someone's offering me something for free, I'm trying to work out what's the catch. Because you see these ads for things that look like they're free, and there's a little asterisk next to the word free, and you dive down the bottom to the fine print, and you discover that conditions apply. The conditions which basically eliminate the meaning of the word free. I saw an ad on TV where you can download really groovy, that's probably not the right word, is it? Really cool ringtones for your phone. And it's flashed across the screen, one free ringtone, SMS this number. Now, 
Have you ever noticed that right down the bottom of the screen in little tiny letters that are very hard to read and they don't stay there for very long, it spells out the conditions. Just for fun, I paused it one day to read what were the conditions of the free ringtone. Well, the ringtone is free if you subscribe to their daily ringtone service. And if you send that number to the, the, the text number, you are agreeing to sign up for a $4.95 per day subscription service, which will deliver you free ringtones that day. Can you work out how much that's going to cost you a week? About $35 a week. For a month, that's about $140 per month for the rest of your life. I hope none of you got trapped on that one. But when I see things that are offered free, I'm thinking, what's the catch? Have you been to one of those websites? And, and a banner sort of appears at the top that says, congratulations, you are the 999,999th person to visit our site. Click here for a free iPad 2. And you're thinking, wow, free. <laughs> My uncle in Nigeria would be proud of me. It says free, but you know it's a con. It's going to end up costing you heaps. And sometimes when you see something that's advertised as free, you're thinking, yeah, what's the catch? This is going to be a bad deal. I want to say to you, when God says to you, I offer it to you and it is at no cost, there is no asterisk. There are no hidden conditions. Because God can offer all this stuff to you freely, because he's already paid the price himself. That's the first thing I want you to know, that what, what God is offering you now is free. Here's the second thing. What God offers is the best. Now look at verse 2, 55 verse 2. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy. God says, why do you keep chasing things that can never satisfy you? Why do you spend so much time and energy and money chasing stuff that in the end is never going to satisfy you? Like you'll be aware that sometimes you feel empty on the inside. It's like there's nothing going on for you. There's a hollowness that other people are not even aware of. There's like a vacuum that's never been filled by anything and you're feeling this emptiness, you're craving satisfaction and then you see in front of you salvation is in sight because behold, the golden arches lie before you. And you're thinking, I'm going to be satisfied. This hunger that I'm feeling is going to be topped up. This is going to be so good. You excitedly burst into the store. I don't quite know why, but you look at the menu board just hoping there might even be something different one day. You get in line, you're getting excited. You're working your way to the front of the line. The hunger is growing within you. The mouth is starting to salivate. By the time you get to the front of the line, you're at the counter. You are frothing at the mouth with excitement. There's a saliva dripping all over the girl's machine. And you place your order, which you've been rehearsing in your mind for the last three minutes. And the girl says, I'm sorry, there'll be a three-minute wait on that. Three minutes! I'm not waiting three minutes! But eventually your food comes, you scoff it down, you're thinking this is the ultimate, this is fantastic, and then you start to feel bloated. And half an hour later, guess what? You're hungry again. God says, why do you spend so much time on stuff that will never satisfy you? It's a really hot day at camp. With the, the really sweaty activities, there's sweat coming from every orifice of every person's body. And your mouth is starting to get that dry feeling. You know, it's just, it's just, it's got to be satisfied. And then your secret friend 
brings, uh, sends someone over with an ice cold Coke. And you know it's cold. It's got the little driplets of condensation coming down the outside. You see on the side of the word Coke, it's got the word enjoy. And it's got the word happiness. And you're thinking, there's a can of happiness waiting for me. <laughs> and your mouth is so dry. And you can almost taste it. And you grab that cold can in your hands and you rip the little thing off the top. And a little fountain of happiness erupts from there. And you scull it down and it is so cold and it's full of gas and sugar and everything else you need. <laughs> and it is so satisfying. And 10 minutes later, you're thirsty again. God says, why are you chasing after things that can never satisfy you? God says, if you trust in me, I'm going to give you things that will totally satisfy you. I want your desire, says God, to be for me. And I want you to trust me that I will give you your heart's desire. Stop chasing the stuff you think is right for you. Start chasing the stuff that I want want to give you. It satisfies. And you know what? It's the best. Now here's the problem. When someone offers you something that's free, you think it's going to be shoddy. You think it's like it's going to be like really bad workmanship. You go to the cricket and some sponsor gives you a free hat. And when you get it, it's like a little cardboard shade and you can't get it to fit, and as you sweat, it sort of gets really soft and soggy at the front. And you know, by the time it's halfway through the first day, you're throwing it away because it was a stupid, free, shoddy little hat. So often, things that are free, we think they're going to be second rate. You know how at Christmas, on actual Christmas Day, it's the big family Christmas dinner, and your parents buy those stupid bonbons, and they make, they force everybody to, to pull the, the crackers. And you've got to wear the stupid hats. <laughs> but there's a free toy inside. Wow. Isn't that exciting? Have you seen the toys they put inside those things? Like a little tiny plastic hat about that big. You know, it would be great if you had a little friend that was that big. What, what, what's the deal? Come on, when you hear that something free, you think it's second rate. You think it's stuff that someone's trying to get rid of. You think it's going to be shoddy merchandise. Have a look at verse 2 again. Second half of verse 2, God says, Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. God says, what I want to give you is the best Possible. It is not second rate. And he uses a picture of feeding us with a meal and saying, you will delight in the richest of fare. Now, I don't know what your favourite meal is. Is it a big, thick, juicy, sizzling on the barbecue steak? Maybe some prawns thrown in. I don't know what it is for you. For me, it's chicken Maryland with everything deep fried. Deep fried chicken, deep fried sweet corn, deep fried potato, deep fried anything you can get your hands on. Just whack it all on the plate and follow it with a nice healthy chocolate mousse. <laughs> Think of your best meal, the sort of meal that you love. And Jesus says, what I'm offering you is of that quality. It's the best you will get. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes... Your favourite meal is actually reserved for when you're a condemned criminal. That just before you die, you get to eat your favourite meal. Jesus saying, no, I want to give it to you now. I want what I give you to lead to life. I want to give you the best life possible. Now, here's the question. Do you believe him? 
When God says, trust in me, give your life to me, follow me, commit yourself to me, and I will give you the best life, do you believe him? Because every time you sin, you're saying, right now, I don't believe you. Every time you do something that is wrong, you're saying to God, at this particular point, my way is better. Every time you decide to do the wrong thing, you're saying to God, your way sucks, my way is better, and I will be more satisfied if I do the wrong thing. So I want to check with you, do you actually believe God? Do you trust him when he says that what he gives you is the best and the absolute best that is humanly possible? Number one, what God offers is free. Number two, what God offers is the best. Number three, what God offers works. Look at verse three. Give ear and come to me. Listen to me so that your soul may live. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought much about your soul living. You probably think about your body living. Right? You've worked out the certain things you need for your body to live. You need water. You need food. You need oxygen. Now, last night I was visiting some of the boys' cabins and I was picking up a distinct lack of oxygen in some of their rooms. Seriously, I walked in, I think, oh my goodness, I don't know what gas is in this room at the moment. It is not oxygen. But you don't get oxygen, you die. So you know what you need for your body to live. Have you ever worked out what you need for your soul to live? Now you might be thinking, hang on, my soul, um, what's my soul? Where, where, where is it? If I had an x-ray, where would they find it? No, 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 your soul is simply you. It's the thing about you that makes you, you. It's not what you look like. It's not what you can achieve. It's what makes you, you. There's Paige sitting down there. Paige, there is a pageness about you. There is something about you that makes you Paige. It's not how you look. It's not how you got your hair. It's not what you're wearing. But there's something brilliant about you that makes you unique and special in the world. That's your pageness. That's your soul. There's, there's Cody over there. Hi, Cody. Well, Cody just arrived at camp today. He, he, had to, he, he was in Perth, hockey tournament. You can ask him the results later. Had to get on the plane at midnight last night, landed at 6 this morning, and then hot tailed out here to be part of Impact. But Cody, I want to say, there is a Codiness about you. There is something about you that makes you, you. It's not what you look like. It's not how good you are at sport. There is something about you that makes you brilliant and makes you unique and special in the world. It's your Codiness. That's your soul. And God says, what I give you will make your soul work. It will make your soul live. And God is saying, come and feast on this because I want to give you the best that is absolutely possible. You see, what God gives you is first rate. He's not, he's not offering you a second rate life. It's not like... Here are all the non-Christians over here doing all the bad things and having lots and lots of fun. And over here are the Christians and they're doing all the nice things and they're doing all the godly things and they're doing all the right things and they're boring, boring, boring and they're missing out on all the fun that everyone's having. God is not like that. God is not a stingy God who says, ha, 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 I want to make your life terrible. Oh, yes, give your life to me and I will crush you. <laughs> it's not like he looks down and thinks, oh, my goodness, they're enjoying themselves. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> oh, they've found out a way to have fun. Let's make up another commandment and stop them. 
God is not like that. He is a heavenly Father who loves you and wants the absolute best for you. And if there's something that's going to be good for you, God says, do it. He only says, don't do it. If he knows it will be bad for you. Listen, verse 2. Listen, says God, eat what is good. You will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen, so that your soul might live. Imagine you organised a birthday party for yourself. Invited all your friends on Facebook. Sent a text message to the really important ones. You went out and bought the decorations. Your family joins in. Lots of food. Lots of great food. We've got balloons. You've got the cake. It's going to be like a big, big party. Imagine that nobody came. You're there in a room full of decorations, happy birthday banners, music playing, food on the table. Nobody comes. You celebrate your birthday by yourself. You get your little happy birthday cupcake and you put a little candle in it and you light the candle and you sing happy birthday to me <laughs> imagine having a party and nobody comes imagine sending out all the invitations, and you want people to say, I'm in, and all you get is answers that say, I'm busy. Sorry, going to another party. Sorry, family function. Yeah, I was coming to your party, but I got a better offer on the way, and so I'm not coming. Come on, if you've got a party, you've got a feast, you want to celebrate, the answer you want is, I'm in. You don't want the answer, I'm busy. The king of the universe is holding a party right now. He's got a banqueting table and he wants you to be part of it. And Jesus tells a story about a, a party goer who sends people out, sends out the invitations and all they get is excuses. He wants people to say, I'm in, but all he gets is the answer, I'm busy. I have bought a field, I need to inspect it. I've bought a cow, I need to go and check it out. They think of any excuse possible and nobody comes to the party. And Jesus is inviting you to his heavenly party. And he says, join me for eternity. I'll give you the best life in the future. And guess what? We're going to have the best life now as well. Do you believe God that he will give you the best life possible? Do you believe him enough to drop whatever it is you're focusing on at the moment and say, I'm in? Or will you just come back with an excuse? I'm not old enough. I haven't had all my questions answered. I don't know if you're the right way. My friends would make fun of me. I'm kind of busy on Friday nights and Sunday nights. If God is inviting you to the best life possible, if God is saying, I want to satisfy every part of you, if God is saying, I want your desire to be for me so that we can enjoy each other for eternity, if God is inviting you to his heavenly party, what answer will you give to God today? Will you say, I'm in? Or will you say, I'm busy? Thanks, guys.